Hey, how's it going? All right, I wanted to make a video to uh, clarify Clive and Bundy's words, verify, and show that this is how I believe. So here, here's what he had to say about race relations and what he understands. What I've seen is civil disturbance. People are not happy. People are thinking they don't have their freedoms and don't have these things. And they... So he's talking about the uh, Watts riots. He was there. He saw the, uh, you know, the fires and stuff back in the 60s. We didn't have them. We've progressed quite a bit to, from that day until now. So if you think back to the 60s, obviously things have gotten better for the race, racial relations, and definitely for black people. And we sure don't want to go back. So clearly he's not for going backwards in time. We sure don't want these colored people to have to go back to that point. We sure don't want these Mexican people to go back to that point. And we can make a difference right now by taking care of some of these bureaucracies. So there's the answer, the bureaucracies. And this is the whole point that he has to make. The bureaucracies, the government, the way that it's being run right now, they're destroying the family. So this is how they did it, you know, and he's going to talk about that. He's going to talk about how the family is what creates the backbone and strengthens the society. And that when you have the government ripping it apart and passing laws that just create uh, black markets, for example, the drug laws are causing turf wars. So you have black people that have a hard time getting a job. And even if they do get a job, it's a minimum wage or a low paying job. When they could go out and sell drugs and in an hour and make a whole week's pay, it doesn't make sense. Not logically, not in any way other than trying to stay out of jail. But the whole thing is a government plan. If you think about it, they, they, uh, they help the drug runners run the drugs. And if the drug runners do just right and do everything correct, then they don't get busted. So the, that all happens. Obviously, it's easy to get drugs. It's easier to get drugs than it is to get alcohol in school. So his point is the bureaucracies, all the stuff that the government is doing is getting in the way of the people. So let's continue. And do it in a peaceful way. Peaceful way. In other words, we don't want to go in there with guns blazing and take out all these bureaucracies and say, this is it. We're done with it. As an American uh, people, we have the ultimate say. We have the power to say yay or nay. And we keep uh, depending on a, on a Congress that doesn't have the support of the people. When less than 10% of the people support the Congress, it no longer has the consent of the people. And that's the only way that they can have legitimate control is with consent. There is no consent. There's no consent under the, for the president or for the Supreme Court. So our government right now is running on zero gasoline. Let me tell, talk to you about the Mexicans. But these are just things I know about the, the, the Negro. I want to tell you one more thing I know about the Negro. Okay, so this is where they, this is the little clip that they clip that they love to go after. And this is the part that uh, we've had the discussions about and why I'm going to talk about it. When I, when I go, went, uh, go through Las Vegas, North Las Vegas, I wanted to say uh, the word Negro is not racist. So if you take that word as racist, then it's because, because you've allowed yourself to become a tool. You are a tool of the race baiters because that word Negro is not racist. It is the, it is the word that was the acceptable word in his time. It's like today you would say uh, black or African-American, and those words are acceptable. In his day, if had you said a black to a person, hey, hey, he's black, if you would have said that, it would have been a huge slap in the face. It would have been like using the N-word. We don't use that word. Not in my house, not in 
anybody's house that I know of. It does not exist. So that's the, you know, that's the thing. A lot of people saw that word. They're like, oh my God, oh, I can't believe he just said that. Yeah, well, just calm down, all right? You guys just need to calm down. That word came from his childhood. And I know about it because I grew up with people like that. That's like my grandparents' age and older. And I would see these little government houses. And in front of that government house, the, the door was usually open, and the, the, the older people and the kids, and there's always at least a half a dozen people sitting on the porch. They didn't have nothing to do. They didn't have nothing for their kids to do. They didn't have nothing for their young girls to do. Okay, so he's setting up these points from his way of thinking. He's trying to tell you what he saw. This is what he saw. It's all cut down to this little tiny clip. So we're going to tell you what he saw. This guy's driving through town. And what's he see? He sees little houses all over the place. In the middle of the day, people should be working. And they're, they're filled with these little groups of people. You know, at least six on every patio. And they're idle. They don't have a job. They don't have uh, anything interesting to do. That This is it. This is their job. Their job is to just live there. So they don't have uh, incentive to be a, uh, to build a community. There is really no incentive. I mean, they're sitting there just, just bored. So what's the young man to do? The young man's going to be out looking for some way to make money. And if the jobs aren't there, or if they aren't enough to support a family, then he's going to do something else. Even if he's getting welfare, do you think welfare pays enough that you can live decently? Come on. Why do you think people in those situations, especially in the in the barrios and in the uh, the ghettos that are so uh, desperate to survive, that they're out there? Uh, selling their bodies and selling drugs and stuff. Why? Because the jobs aren't there. Why aren't the jobs there? Well, there's a couple good reasons for that, and that could be a whole nother video. The, the number one reason is there's not enough investment in those communities. People are afraid of the riots. They've seen the riots that he's talking about, the Watts riots, the, riot, the L.A. riots. You know, communities burn to the ground. The, you hear what I'm saying? To the ground. Can you imagine having a store and it getting burned down and the insurance not paying for it because it's called, considered an uprising or a political thing? Look at your insurance. Do you think that your house is covered if a bunch of people come down the street and set it on fire because they're mad at the government? No, it's not covered. You need to pay extra. Anyway, I digress. And because they were basically on government subsidy and so now what do they do they abort their their young children now is that racist uh let's do let's cut this up is that racist he's saying what are they doing now they're aborting their children at a higher rate than ever before killing their babies you know whose idea was this maybe it's the racists that are, have been pushing abortion on these people and saying, you know, that's that's empowering. How is that empowering? You know, when I was growing up, fam black families were pretty big. You had at least, you know, four or five kids in the family. And, and uh, you know, there was the dad was there and, and the mom. And there was really a sturdy family uh, knot. You could not break that knot. They depended on each other. But in the 60s, something happened. They switched over. And all this change happened. So if you want to compare, you know, 62 to today or 64 to today and look at the, just take a look at the historical documents. And tell me that things got better under these this bureaucracy of support of welfare you tell me that it helped them tell me and i will prove you wrong 
they put their young men in jail because they never they never learned how to pick cotton. Now there's another statement. Everybody says that racist. They didn't. They're in jail because they didn't learn to pick cotton. You know, it sounds racist, but you know what? You're misinterpreting his words. He's saying that the the slaves had a job. They got up in the morning and they had a job. They were either picking cotton, they were running the cotton gin, they were uh, planting food, they were doing all the things. They were running a farm. That's what they did. They ran the farm. And he's saying, what's the difference between then and now? He's not saying that that one is better than the other. He didn't say, you should go back to slavery. He never said that. And that's the point that I'm making here. He's not even suggesting that. He said it before. He doesn't want them to go back to the Watts riot, riots. Doesn't want that. He wants what's better for them. Let's, let's continue listening. And I've often wondered, oh, are they better off as slaves, picking cotton, having family life and doing things? Or are they better off under government subsidy? So here was his point, and he tried to clarify it. And again, it just came across wrong for today's society, for today's uh, dumbed-down children who have been uh, politically correctly taught by the public schools to believe that everything is racist. Look for racism everywhere because it exists everywhere. Well, if you ever watch Pollyanna, the movie, then you'll know that if you look hard enough, you'll find the bad in everyone. Yeah, they didn't get no more freedom. They got less freedom. They had less uh, family uh, alive and their happiness. You can see in their... So he's, ta he's comparing those people that are stuck in these little houses that are avoiding the gunfire that are sh people shooting across at each other because they're fighting over drug turf because the government created this this horrible drug war and threw it on these communities and the communities are going help help i mean the good people in the communities are going we don't know what to do help us we don't want this in our community you know it's just a handful but the government's created the problem they figured it out you know they take scientists to figure this stuff out they take they spend a lot of money and they say now how can we wipe out more black people than ever before We've got it. We'll empower the women with abortion. He just pointed that out. But we're not going to talk about that whole issue because that's racist, right? Because that's what they've insisted on making abortion considered a racist topic. Womanizing, right? You're taking away women's rights. What about the child? Is there any rights to the child? Are half the babies that are aborted women or female? You know? So anyway. Faces they weren't happy sitting on that concrete, concrete sidewalk. Down there they were probably growing their turnips. He said that they are not happy. In other words, they're stuck in this condition. They're they're avoiding the gunfire. They're they're in this place hoping that the government will continue funding because that's the only thing that they have to eat. If the government quits, they'll starve. Have you ever fed wildlife like uh, squirrels? And have you noticed that they become absolutely dependent on you? And that if you go away for the summer, they all die? Have you ever noticed that? That's why we tell people now, don't feed the wildlife. Do not feed the wildlife. So when, when, when I say that to people and say, you know, this is what why welfare is so bad, People say, that's racist because you're calling people wildlife. No, I'm not. And I believe there should be a safety net. I absolutely believe it. But I think the safety net should be a safety net and not a hammock. You shouldn't live in it. It's meant to catch you from falling to the bottom. And, you, and when it does catch you, it should just support you at the very, very lowest level. It, there should be no... You shouldn't be able to go down to the store with your food stamps and buy uh, expensive foods. You should be at the bottom, right? You know, you should be able to buy certain foods with food stamps, right? 
real foods with real food values, like the WIC program. You get coupons. Here's, here's a milk coupon. Here's a cheese coupon. Here's a butter coupon. You know, that would work for me. But giving people coupons for cash for food, of any kind of food, you know, just that's not what it's for. That wasn't the plan. But really, food stamps is one of the smallest issues. It's one of the smallest bureaucracies, and it's one of the least concerns for me. I would rather throw away food. Give, I mean, you know what I'm saying. See, there, there's how we misstate. I meant I would rather throw away money towards food for people, even if they misuse the, the, the coupons, even if they sell the coupons and trade it in for drug money. I would rather that than, you know, building bombs that are just going to be dropped on little huts in Pakistan, people that they suspect is terrorists, you know. I would rather them waste that money on, on these uh, situations. And maybe that would reduce the need for people to kill people to get their drug habits fulfilled. You know, so, yeah, if you can do whatever you can do, I know the government doesn't want to legalize drugs because that would just make their, their uh, they wouldn't be able to uh, continue controlling society the way they do. I mean, you really need drug laws or something similar to uh, control, right? You, how many people do we have in jail here in the United States right now? More than any other country in the world per capita, right? More than China, more than Iran, more than any other country. It's really, it's huge business. It's a fantastic. And per capita, the majority of the people in there are blacks. Not that most are blacks. The point is, that blacks make up a very small percent of the community, yet they make a large percent of prisons. So if you think that the society as it's set up today is somehow better, this, this is actually helpful to black people compared to the way it was under slavery, you know, you've got to look another way. Yes, uh, yes, slaves owned uh, slaves were freed, and once they became free, they they could own other slaves, and they did. They would buy their own plantains and or plantations, and they would actually hire. They would buy slaves and treat them, hopefully, very well because they were slaves as well at one time. So, you know, the point that he was trying to make is there were slaves that had it better than the some of the people have it in those terrible con living conditions that he spoke of now he, and never did he say all black people are in that condition did he say everybody every black person that i everywhere i go i see black people no he didn't say any of that and why do you people insist on twisting it that way it really makes you look racist so that's all government. That's not freedom. Now let me talk about the Spanish people. All right. So he finished talking about the black people. And in that whole time, everything he said that came across racist, I answered it. And I believe that nary a time did he say something that, that he meant to come across as racist. Not even once. And everything that he said was in support of the black family. That's what he said. And to carry on, he's going to talk about how family has made things better, and he can see that. He's Look, the black family has been completely destroyed in America. It's toast. It has been ripped apart. What do you see? You see young girls having babies out of wedlock. You see... Uh, almost no marriages. The children are born out of wedlock. And it's because of the society. We set it up this way. We hired these people. We put them in power. We said, make these laws. And we did it. 
So, you know, we're not really blameless here. But, you know, we if we want to fix it, we need to do what Clyde's saying here. And that is, we need to stop what the government's doing. Get the government out of it. Let's go back to 64 in the sense of the family, not in the sense of having the gov- having uh, black people whipped by the uh, KKK and hung by a tree and a, and a frickin' uh, cross burned in their front yard, for God's sakes. That was not anything to do with what he's talking about. He's talking about what I mean in the 60s when you went to a black family's house as a Cub Scout, and the, and the dad was being a uh, a leader, and you went to their house, you know, their house was no different than mine, and everything about them, their family, was just like mine. You know, why does it have to be different today? Because the government is giving benefits to people who do what they want them to do, and that is kick the dad out. If the dad lives there, you get no benefits. If the dad's not there, you get all the benefits. So what's the dad have to do? He has to leave, even if he wants to be a good dad. How is that freaking helping them? You tell me. You know, I understand that they come over here against our Constitution and cross our borders. <clears throat> but they're here, and they're people. And I've worked beside beside a, a lot of them. Don't tell me they don't work, and don't tell me they don't pay taxes. Mm-hmm. So now he's talking about the Mexicans, and he's saying, you know, he's heard a lot of people saying that, uh, you know, these people are coming over the borders, and, uh, you know, they're not paying taxes, and they're taking all the benefits, and this is what you're hearing. Oh, they're lazy, they don't work, it's just bullshit. Excuse my French. It's bull. These people are coming over the border. They're used to making 60 cents an hour. They come over here and they make eight bucks an hour and they are thrilled. They're sending a ton of money home because their mom and dad are hungry back there and they don't have any income. They don't have all this support that we have here, the governmental support. So yeah, it's it's. It's called family values. It's called, you know, I'm not just going to, I didn't just get dumped here off a turnip truck. My parents brought me here. The reason I am alive today is because my parents raised me from a baby up to an adult and then said, now you've got your education, you have your uh, everything in order for your life to continue. All you have to do is don't make a lot of big mistakes. And you'll be fine. And that's what they did. And now, are you just going to... This is what Americans do. This is what we've been taught. Once the once you hit 18, hit the road. The parents are throwing them out at 18. So what do you think the kid's going to do? Okay, I'm out. See you later. Bye. So when the parents get old and they need some help, the kids are like, what? Who are you? I hardly know you. So Cliven's argument here is that the Mexicans show a real family ethic. They ha- they weren't raised here in America, you know. He's not talking about the Mexicans that were born in America and and were re- and went to school in America and raised in America. He's talking about the Mexicans that came over the border, the ones that have the family ethic, the tight knit families that go all the way to the very oldest down to the very youngest including the preborns, the fetuses that are humans, that have the eyes and the ears and the nose and the brain and the thoughts and the dreams and the wiggles and the giggles and all that stuff. They're all part of the family. That's why they have big families, because they don't kill their babies. And this is what he's trying to tell us. And don't tell me they don't have better family structures than most of us white people. When you see those Mexican families, they're together, they're picnic together, they're spending their time together. And I'll tell you, in my way of thinking, they're awful nice people. So he's trying to teach us a lesson through their example. And he's saying, 
this is the way he was raised, like those Mexicans are. He was pre-1964 when they, when they decided that God isn't welcome in school anymore. When they decided that um, everybody needs the government's help, that no one can survive on their own. You know, what did we do before the government came and, and supported everybody? And we need to have those people join us and be with us. So he's talking about the illegal aliens. It's, it's straight up. He is not talking about the, the uh, Mexicans that are already here. He's, they're already here. He's saying, I want those Mexican people. I worked with them. They're good, hardworking people. They're not out to get me. They haven't been raised in American schools. They haven't been taught that there is no uh, absolutes. There is no, you won't be held accountable for your actions. You just do whatever you like, whatever makes you happy. You just go ahead and you do that. Yeah. And now, what? 40 years later, we get to see the damage done. Look what's happened to our society. And look at the difference between our society and other societies that decided to stay on the route that we were on before. Look at those societies. Compare them. And that's what he's doing. He's saying, do you think that the black people would have been better off in a, in a uh, urban society like they were when they were in slavery where they had uh, a, little, a little house and they had their little church and they did their little belief stuff and they did their little... They were free in that sense that they don't have that freedom today. You don't. And if you are part of the government-funded housing and there's rules. I mean, in some government-funded housing, you can't even have a gun, even though you, that's your Second Amendment right. How can they tell you not to speak freely? That's your First Amendment, right? You can't have, right? You can't gather. What? What? How can they tell us what our rights are, are our protected rights? How can they do that? Just because they give you something, now they can tell you? Well, I would say, you give it back to them. You don't want to give up your rights to get a few things. And if you're willing to give up your rights to, to make life easier for yourself, you're going to find out that over time, they're just going to keep taking them and taking them and taking them. And this is what Clyde's talking about. He's talking about the government and their bureaucracies destroying America. Not just the black people, because he just said it here. He said white people. He said these people, these Mexicans, are better than the white people. He said that because he was talking about people that were outside the country. Now, I've seen uh, real African children come to America six, eight, 10, 12, 15 years old, don't speak English. And very quickly they learn English and they accelerate through the classes and they become the top of their classes. Doesn't matter where they come from. It's because they see opportunity they never had before and they grab it. They go for it. Whereas our society has taught them, oh, the society, you know, we've got so much, just don't worry about it. It'll always be here. So you have the kids, blacks and whites, in our schools, laying around in the back corner going, uh-huh, yeah, okay, yawn, yawn, right? It's there. We all know it. Not, not, not come to our party. So he's asking those Mexicans, those illegals, come on over the border. You're welcome in my house. And... And I'm sure if there were Africans coming from Liberia today or from any one of those African nations that, that came over illegally, maybe they, they skipped over the border from Mexico, he would house them because they don't have all this negativity in them. They haven't been uh, taught and raised to be uh, mentally uh, dependent like the squirrels. Anyhow, this is more than long enough, so good talking to you guys. Talk to you later. Bye.